use concrete there because if you use uh, if you use blacktop, the rain will just wash it up and wash it away. And what they do is they use big rocks instead of pebbles, and they lay gypsum on top of that, like it's in wallboard, because it's very drying. It's five times more drying and toxic than sulfur. So they lay this all on top of the, uh, the stones, uh, the rocks, before they lay the concrete, or else it won't dry, and it'll just wash out. So driving along these sections, the one particular section where I was traveling in, the section that they had just laid probably in the last two months but didn't go back and take the cones away. So when you, at least you have to wait for the traffic to finish going one way before you start going, because it's just one way uh, at that point, one avenue. So. Uh, I was almost in out of the section where it was two lane again, unpaved. And uh, this, uh, the first vehicle I passed was about two hours after I had uh, been traveling. A van was going about 100 kilometers an hour, and he doesn't stop. His, uh, his door clipped my elbow, flipped me over in my bike, so I took all, you know, on the rock, everything. This time I tumbled because I kicked the bike away as I was in the air. And, uh, but I tumbled, I still took all the skin off. Now, in, in that, if you remember the motorcycle accident, oh the motorcycle accident two years ago where I broke the femur and everything, I took more skin oh, off. she wants to help you heal. She's I know, you put some bacteria on it. Yeah, she wants to heal you. This happened this year? That happened two months ago, six, seven weeks ago. Um, so, but the, that healed in 12 days. I put the, the lime juice on it and the coconut cream and the honey and the meat. So I did it this time, but I had to go buy the honey. So I went to buy the honey and I found this great Thai honey in the, in the Philippines. You know, so I'm putting it on this wound and it's just festering. It's getting worse and worse. Of course, I had the gypsum in it. And they don't have the regular limes there. The little limes are miniature oranges, which are cross between the limes and oranges. So I didn't have the benefit of the uh, lime juice to surround the particles of gypsum. So it just kept drying. That's what this dryness is here. It's all the gypsum. This thing was ripped open from here to here. Wow. What is it, gypsum? Gypsum is a mineral, like sulfur, only it's five times more drying. It's what they use in drywall, because oh. it's so drying. You put so, it on your leg? Pardon? You put it on your leg? It was on the, it was on the ground, on the, so it got all in there. So I was dealing with that. And then after about nine days, it was my leg was getting very, very painful. And the other time I had done that, the whole thing healed. I mean, I had twice as much skin gone on my arm and everywhere. The last time it healed all in 12 days, completely healed over. And this, there was something wrong. I thought it was just the gypsum. So I asked this, uh, I was gonna change the bandages. I asked the taxi to go give me some raw, thin sl sl slices of meat. So he came back to help me uh, change the, the, the uh, bandages. And uh, he looked, took a look at the honey and he said, that's not real honey. Mm. He said, no, that was, they've learned to make a Thai tasting honey here from a fruit and they use sweet and low, it was aspartame. Oh, oh my God. God. Oh. So I've been putting all of this chemical solution oh, on my leg all this time. Well, that caused, you know, I, I took insulin from the age of 15 and a half to the age of 22. And whenever I have a massage, there's always lumps and tightness in my calves. My calves have always been very, very large uh, since that time. And if the massage therapist pushed, pushed even a little too hard, it was painful. I could hit the ceiling. Well, for some reason, the, the whole process of this started the insulin leaving my thighs. I mean, my calves. And that's what these are. These are insulin dumps and sores. 
So, and of course, the gypsum is there too. Yeah, so. They didn't have the ingredients on the site. Oh. This is primitive land. <laughs> Nothing's labeled if it's marked if it's made by man. So, so um, the uh, taxi driver um, <laughs> immediately went to a, a farm there, and, and we got fresh honey right out of the hive. So that the next day was a different you know, subject, but I had already poisoned it. You know what aspartame is? Yeah. Aspartame is a poison. That is, and I was drinking it too. Oh. I was drinking that honey. So I drank about a cup of it and put it probably a half a cup on my leg before I found it. Because it tasted exactly like the Thai honey that I had just left Thailand. And I had just finished that on the plane. So I was going to get some fresh honey here. And I thought, oh, Thai honey here, how great. But they got it tasting exactly like the Thai honey. It's a special fruit that they have. And they boil it to make it with all that aspartame. But how did you find it was aspartame? Because I went back and found that. And this fellow also knew what it was made of. Because he had made it himself. There's good money in it. People think, you know, something tastes like honey and a sweetener. They'll use that to uh, that as a sweetener, so sure. So um, a lot of people say, oh my God, it's festering. It's gone on for eight weeks now, I mean seven weeks. What else is there to do? Go to a doctor and get more poisons and take care of it? I just have to be patient. It's painful at times. It gets very, very tight. If anybody gets too near, near me, they'll probably smell the old urine. Because I put the urine on it and um, keeps it from going into gangrene. I'd rather not have the fungus work on it because it's too dry and too itchy. So I use the uh, uh, the uh, urine and uh, bone marrow and bone marrow to keep it from getting too dry. And then it started on this leg. Oh, this leg wasn't damaged. Aspartame. Wow. I mean the uh, the insulin. It was in my calves. Of course, I did most of the shooting of the insulin into this thigh. So most of it went in here, just a little bit went in here, because maybe 15% of the time I shot it into this thigh. And I didn't shoot any into my right arm. I always shot into my left. So I had another one that came out here that went in and several here that also came out discharged. It smelled just like the insulin. That I, had been, that I had shot up for that seven and a half years. So the point of this is, no matter how careful you can be, <laughs> there's always going to be something out there that you just need that you're going to miss. You know, I missed the honey incident and had that happen. And of course, all the insulin in my body, people are going to detox at times. All the old stuff probably because I have the hydrochloric acid, it lowers my ability to chelate with chemicals. Most people don't have to go through this kind of thing. Of course, most diabetics do in their later years. This will go to the toes first usually, and they'll get their toes amputated, and then their, their uh, foot, and then their leg, and then the lower part of the leg, and then the upper leg, usually when they're in their 50s and 60s. So I guess what I have to assume from that then is since most people, most diabetics who take insulin have that kind of a detox at that time in their life, that is the time when the body does it. And I'm 62 now. So whether this inspired it or stimulated it, I don't know. It could be entirely coincidental or it could be just that chapter in my life where the body said, okay, it's time to get rid of the old insulin. So anyway, I have no more lumps in my thigh. I can press. No pain. The pain's here, though, in the skin. <coughs> and it comes out. It's funny. I was looking at, uh, through my electronic microscope, I was looking at the blood that's blood that's there. You see that's crusted like that. And there are actually crystals formed from the insulin. Crystals form. And they grow. They're actually growing in my leg as it dumps. So while the chemistry can do to the human body, again, I want to stress the point is do not panic. Do not go to a hospital or a doctor because they're just going to put more chemicals in you that you're going to have to get rid of later. And my legs aren't going to fall 
He said, this whole thing was really bad all over. Even down on my foot, almost all the sores were down on my foot. There's barely a scab there. So um, it's healing. I just have to be patient. Probably another two weeks and it will be over. Okay, we're going to start with the Q&A now. Just, just Do you have a question? Uh, he said that uh, we should uh, sleep for uh, three hours and then get up at something. And, uh, and supposedly that we uh, cannibalize our red blood cells. Uh -huh. I ran a little search looking for, for that. I couldn't come up with anything. So uh, where are you uh, from? Well, when you when um, I studied blood analysis, and the higher the ketone level, uh, the shows that your body's digesting its own uh, cells as the ketones rise. Of course, the medical profession simplifies it and say, oh, you know, your kidneys are breaking down or your liver is breaking down or something like that. But I found that with the blood test, I could see the blood um, count lower after five hours. So and, uh, I had an MD that took on uh, six people, took the blood every 30 minutes during sleep. And uh, what they had, we put a catheter in the individuals. And uh, so that, and we weren't taking out a lot of blood. It wasn't like the hospital, the hospitals take out 100 times more blood than's necessary. When they take your blood, a tube like this, they use not even a teaspoon of it for the analysis. They just take all your blood. I wouldn't let them do that now that I know that. You know, I would say, yeah, you can take a tablespoon, and that's it. And if you need for different tests, then I'll give you five tablespoons. <laughs> if you've got five tests to do, but you're not gonna take a whole two or three cc's for every test that you want done when you're only gonna use not even a, a teaspoon. So, because you know, it takes a long time to rebuild that. Anyway, we saw that the, um, the blood, uh, red blood cell level decreased without swelling of the pancreas. Means that, I mean, the, um, the spleen, so the blood, red blood cells weren't backing up into the spleen, because you know the spleen is a reservoir for red blood cells. If you have a terrible bleed, you have like one and a half to two pints of red blood cells in the spleen. So if you have an accident and you lose two cups of blood or a cup and a half of blood, you get the blood right back into the system so you don't become anemic. And of course, if you were a caveman back in those days, I believe you'd be dinner if you were anemic. You know, so um, the spleen is a reservoir for red blood cells. So there was no um, uh, increase in the splenic size. So the red blood cells weren't going there. But we measured an average of about two to four uh, tablespoons of red blood cell loss uh, after eight hours of sleep. And of course, then it became compounded for people that slept nine and 10 hours. And it began right at the five hour point. Ketone level became very high and kept growing. And the, the concentration of red blood cells diminished. And what's and the result point. of that? When that happens and what is your, what is the You have anemia effect? when you wake in the morning. Oh, I see. So you know, people are right now, they wake in the morning after eight hours sleep and they're still tired. So they go for some drug, they go for caffeine or nicotine or theobromine and chocolate to give them a charge or a heavy sugar to give them a charge. That's no remedy for anemia. Eating is a remedy for anemia. And I told people who wake, you know, at, uh, you know, I usually tell people, wait during the middle of the night, eat something and go back to sleep so that something with protein in it, so that that doesn't mean fruit unless it's let's say coconut, but eggs, milk, uh, meat, anything like that, just a little bit, even if it's just a half a cup of milk, that will prevent it. And when we did this, ran the test the next night um, with the same people, the ketone level was almost negligent. You know, we've always got some sort of a ketone level because we break down, you know, cells all the time in the body. So the ketone level was normal, and the, uh, the red blood count was normal for everybody who ate it. One person ate an egg, uh, two women drank a half a cup of milk each, 
couple of men drank um, a whole cup of milk. So one egg was okay? One egg was not. That was all this one woman needed so you know, to, to handle hers. I didn't think it would, but it handled it. So you would probably recommend two if you were going to make a family? Yeah, you know, you're our size, you definitely. Two. She was more diminutive. Um, I think she got 5'1", something like that. It was very small. So um, if you have a tendency to be hyperactive, a high energetic person during the day, then if you wake up after five hours and eat, you're not likely to go back to sleep. It might energize you too much. So I tell some people, wake after three hours, eat, and then go to the next food for five hours. And that resolves it. You, pardon? Got what's got in you done? That's not really in your journal. Well. No, no, uh, you're not going to see that because the doctors don't look at anything in a natural perspective. David, do you have a question? Yes. Um, what do you think about um, juicing kale, juicing uh, beets, beet greens, turnips, um, cabbage? Um, Asparagus. Yeah, what, what about, because I know you, you talk about, you know, some of, you talk in, in, um, <clears throat> in your book, the first book about um, some of the, you, you discovered that some of the vegetables have almost medicinal qualities and they should be, you have a list of ones that should be approached with caution, adding them to your juice. <clears throat> what, um, what dangers would I be or what effects or betterments would I be? Uh, getting on myself by, you know, overdosing on Well, the problem with overdosing is it interferes with digestion and it could bring on a hell of a detoxification. You talked about beet juice and beet juice. Well, the beet juice is high in sugar. That alone could cause, you know, a, a carbohydrate detoxification and old toxic glycogen. Uh, you know, because we store a lot of toxic glycogen in our bodies so we can't convert it properly because we don't make the proper insulin. It's not like the chemical insulin like the pharmaceutical house is using, but it still will cause emotional and physical imbalances and sugar levels. So, and when you're using, like I, I'll use a lot more carrot these days to help get the bile out of the body. Um, people who turn orange with the carrot juice, um, I used to think it was the carotene also, undigested carotene, that if you weren't processing properly, they didn't have the bile to process it properly. But when I did skin scrapings on people who had, on the palms, they had all of that very orangish uh, cast, I found there was a lot of toxic bile that was not utilized properly. And very little of it was, uh, was the carotene. <laughs> So I, that's how I discovered that the carrot juice and the carotene and the carrot juice help remove toxic stored bile in the body. And it especially happens on yellow people like Asians. Like uh, one girl who was here a little earlier, Elena, uh, when she went on this diet about three years ago, she was a normal Asian, very, very yellow from eating all of the rice that requires a lot of um, a lot of bile to break it down uh, into a, a fat. And because we have to, if you're on a diet that you're not eating fat, your body's gonna have to convert proteins and carbohydrates into acetates, which are fats. They're very poor fats. And in the Asians, the bile and the, the um, acetate mixes together and lubricates their skin. So they've got this very yellowish skin. Now in the last three years that she's been on the diet, she's half as yellow as she used to be. In fact, her hands are now almost pink like mine, only the palms are still yellow, orangish and yellow. And I have quite a few Asian patients in Singapore uh, who are on the diet and the same, same things happen. In fact, one of you looks like a white guy now. So he used to be very yellow. Yeah. But what do you think of the kale as, as you know, as, as adding a lot of that? And well, like I said, kale is very detoxifying for certain things, so. What about you know, if you just want to add like minerals and, and you know, to your, to your body? Is it, how's it for that? 
Like I say, you can use a certain amount of vegetable juice in a day, which is fine. Anything over that, you're not going to get a good base mineral. The minerals that we digest to build the body properly are minerals from animal products. Those we digest absolutely. So if you want to use it, I use the, um, the minerals in vegetable juice to help chelate with a certain amount of certain toxins that are in the blood and in the digestive tract, not to add to the minerals for base, uh, having a good foundation in the body. I use cheese and honey eaten together allows the cheese to be digested and all the minerals absorbed. When you eat raw cheese, unsalted raw cheese, it is impossible, I found by checking the feces, for the human to digest very much of it all, maybe two to five percent. So what it does is it acts as a magnet and broom and, uh, and a vacuum and a sponge and attracts poisons out of the fluid systems as they run through the elementary canal, the neurological, the lymphatic, and the blood. So the, the cheese ha draws it out of those systems as it passes through as they weave their way through the digestive tract. And then the cheese holds onto it like a sponge and then dumps it out the feces. Now when I check the feces after eating salted raw cheese or cheese made from pasteurized dairy, it doesn't do that, it's reabsorbed. So all those toxins that are absorbed by the cheese um, are reabsorbed by the body when you digest them. However, I found in my experiments that if I mix cheese now, I got this from a model. I was dating a model. Um, and she was ultra skinny, not quite as skinny as Twiggy, but just about. And uh, she's, she just got into this honey and cheese binge. And she's eating like a pound of honey a day with like a half a cup of cheese, I mean, half a cup of honey with about a pound of cheese a day. And she put on 50 pounds in a month. Whoa. That was great because she calmed down, but she certainly stopped working instantly. <laughs> Gained 50 pounds in a month. That was a lot. She couldn't. She couldn't stop it. You know, she was so starved and hungry, she couldn't help herself. And that's the problem with a lot of vegetarians. But I was not eating a lot of meat then. I was only eating raw meat three days a week, and not every day, twice daily. And she was pretty much doing the diet, so it wasn't a very balanced diet. She'd been eating the meat. She wouldn't have gotten that kind of craving. I got a call two years ago from uh, a, a supermodel named Jennifer, and uh, I didn't get her last name. But she called to thank me that all the supermodels that she hangs with are so delighted because they're so balanced on this diet and they don't have to eat till they get fat or vomit and starve. They can eat, be nourished, and don't have to put a lot of weight. I said, it's good to have the weight, though, you know. Um, they said, yeah, but at least we feel calm and we don't feel like vomiting and we're not starving anymore. We feel very good and we don't have to be, you know, we didn't have to put on much weight. So, so if I want to experiment with other vegetable juices, what do you recommend outside of your usual? Well, what I say is if you're going to do those things, do it no more than 5% of your juice. And I say that in the recipe book. If you're going to use kale, leeks, or anything like that, never more than 5% of your juice to be on the safe side. There could be athletes who could use 10% of your heavy exercise, uh, which would be fine. But again, the cheese is to absorb minerals with honey, and the vegetable juice is just to chelate, use those minerals to neutralize the over acidity in the bloodstream from all the toxicity from the cooked foods for all the years of cooked foods. And there are books out there that will tell the benefits of vegetables. Um, you know, Walker's Juice Book, uh, he tells the benefit of what some juices can do. Now, I didn't find all of the same when I was experimenting with various vegetable juices and herbs for that short year and a half period. I didn't find that it always coordinated with what he thought it did. I think that because I knew Walker, he was more theoretical than experimental and didn't back up 
he didn't do the experiments, he didn't do the lab work that I did, that I used to do. Still, I should do some, uh, but it's mainly just looking at a microscope. But I don't go into the laboratory and mix anything. I send those tests to be done now. I don't even walk into a laboratory. So, so in um, one way, you're kind of saying that it's okay to experiment with juices, but you haven't but really researched Don't overdo it. When, like, what if I want to make um, 32 ounces of uh, beet juice and turnip juice and drink it one and one day and one two days later? I mean, is that going to well, help? Well, probably not going to cause a problem. Beet juice. You know, when women drink beet juice and it's near their period, they bleed excessively. Um, red cabbage juice will do the same thing, cause severe bleeding, will also, also cause ulcerations. The green cabbage will do just the reverse, it will slow down the menses and, uh, or will slow the flow of the menses and, uh, and heal ulcerations and stop bleeding. So, so I'm saying when you take something and you concentrate it, you better be careful. But the result. Okay. If you do it, just let me know what you experience. I'll take the info. Okay, okay, you but you be my guinea pig. I'm but but it. You, but it, but if I if I'm experience, I don't want to I want to either ex, I don't want to just take the time digestion time to digest salad. Time. And you can't, I want, you can't digest it. What? Well, I know. What do you mean? It takes an herbivore. An herbivore has two and a half. I know, I know, I know that. But so I want to experiment with other vegetables right now. Uh, I want juices. Yeah. And in the juice format. Yeah. And I just was, you know, and I have been doing it. I have been experimenting with turnip and beet and kale and parsley and I throw celery in there and and it's, you know, I, I just I go through phases and that's kind of what I'm doing right now. And kind of what I'm asking is whether, what do you you know, you know me, I do what I want to. I don't follow anything particularly, but um, what kind of advice can you throw at me because I'm going through this phase where I'm, you know, I'm still eating the raw meat and the milk and everything. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of advice can you throw at me um, since I'm going through this juicing phase, you know, where I'm just getting, I'm just doing a lot of juicing. I'm, I'm like juicing every second, two or three days. Mm -hmm. I'm drinking like 16 ounces once or twice a day. I feel like I'm putting minerals into my body, you know. Um, but just like I said, when you, you when your body uses the minerals from the vegetable juice to neutralize toxicity and over acidity in the blood and the rest of the system, then you can use the minerals in your meat and dairy to rebuild and strengthen your body. But you cannot use minerals. Uh, well, you can, but it's not as healthy. You've got uh, your races are weaker, who, uh, you know, use a lot of your minerals from, from vegetation as, as your base cellular uh, construction of needs. Whereas the tribes and the animals who use animal tissue, the minerals in animal tissue and animal fluids like milk to build their systems are a lot healthier, a lot stronger. I'm, they handle heat better and everything. So. I'm, I'm drinking, I'm getting, uh, uh, I'm getting never refrigerated goat's milk now. I'm getting about, wow, terrific. I'm getting like um, four or five gallons every two weeks. Congratulations. Yeah, and um, it's wonderful tasting. Yeah. And, um, so I'm adding that. So, so now if I'm adding that, that's kind of taking part of the meat, the, of the, of the place of meat. Very concentrated minerals in the, in the milk. So can I maybe cut down cut down on the meat because of uh, the un you know uh, un, unrefrigerated goat's milk I'm getting. Explore it and see. Yeah. You okay. know I've only found uh, three women who could live on just raw milk. And with no meat at all. So maybe I and so maybe I could chicken. possibly even uh, eliminate the meat eventually. Just go with the raw goat's milk. I'm, I'm you can try. You see. Well, I, I still like the meat. I mean, yeah. it's, meat is very attractive to me. So, okay. When you when you <coughs> never refrigerate uh, the milk, um, you have the growth hormones that are active. As soon as the milk goes below about 72, 71 degrees, the uh, growth hormones that are in the milk for the calf 
go dormant. They aren't utilized the same way. And you have to just let them get out of that oil. It doesn't make any difference. Once it's chilled to that temperature, it'll never recreate itself again. So the milk that lost it is good. No, still it's very healthy. I certainly drink a half a gallon a day, but uh, and when I can, I get the raw milk never refrigerated, but that's a rarity. So I just have to eat more red meat. I mean more meats, <coughs> fish and chicken. And I've got a good source of anybody else's energy source. About 25 they have a gallon. Yeah, there's, they're, they're, they can get a lot more out if you want to work something out with them. Well, I'm too thin. When I have goat's milk, I lose even more weight. So for me, it's not. You know, people, I only recommend goat's milk for people who are overweight and people who have sugar problems and diabetes. And you might find that you start getting pretty thin which if you're I just drinking joke, you go to milk and not eat Which is part of the motivation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, shoot. I do him because my tape my tape player is going up. Do, do right. him the, the Okay, Jim. Uh, this is about... <clears throat> Water retention, it was a whole lot worse before the primal diet, but you know, I can push on my ankle and it makes a dent, you know, and it gradually comes back, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and it gets worse if I eat cooked food with a lot of salt, but it never really goes away, particularly in the summertime. Um, is there something else I should be doing? Well, uh, the trick is not to gulp any, um, any dairy, I mean, any liquids at all. And if you're going to drink water, it should be no more than, let's say, a sip, you know, a tablespoon, two tablespoons at a time. When you gulp your fluids, the body rushes a lot of the H2O to the kidney. And then the, um, the nutrients cannot uh, transport the H2O to the cells. When you're eating raw food, you've got all the active ions and everything available to transport and, and when you cook a food all the ions fractionate from the water so then it's water it's just water it's not bound ionically active H2O um, so you will dehydrate by drinking water that's why I suggest people do not drink water it's also a solvent why do you think people go around hosing things off washing things with water because it's a solvent, it breaks things down, dissolves them. When you have it in your intestines and the rest of your body, it'll wash your nutrients away, it'll destroy and dilute your bacteria, it'll do all kinds of negative things, unless you're just sipping. And your body converts that little bit of water into solvents to help dissolve some matter that uh, needs flushing out of the system. But mainly we can do it with the water and foods. Milk is 86% water meets 55% water. Uh, fruits, uh, including cucumbers, are 93% water. That's plenty of water, but you cannot gulp. You gulp, it rushes to the kidneys, you dump it out the bladder, where's your water going? So it w if it doesn't go, go to the kidney, and it's rushing into the system too quick, it's going to be absorbed too quick, and the body's going to keep it in the connective tissue until it can find some way to utilize it. It's usually if you have a poor kidney and you don't have the greatest kidneys in the world. So then I should eat slowly as well as You should slowly. drink. Well, you don't have to eat your meat and, and other solid foods slowly, but you certainly need to drink your fluids slowly. Um, would you hand me my bag over there? Is this one? Yeah. Now I suck. <laughs> 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 That's what I do. What about chewing your juice? You can chew it, but if you do like an infant does, what I do is I put my teeth together over my lips, I put my tongue behind my back teeth, and I suck. Hmm. I only consumed about two tablespoons of milk just then, but because I sucked it, I got all the saliva with the bacteria. And that's what infants do. They get that bacteria in the milk. We have almost two times more bacteria in our salivary uh, 
juices that a dog and a cat do. In fact, we have more bacteria than any other creature on the planet besides a fly. So, you know, the fly, they'll spit on you and start dissolving your tissue. That's what flies do. They spit on their their object that they're eating to start pre-digesting it even before they suck it up. We need to suck. So if you suck your fluids, um, then you'll have more bacteria in it and you won't be gulping. You won't be as thirsty. When you gulp, rushes to the kidneys or the connective tissue and then you're dehydrated. And people who drink and drink and drink. Now I used to drink a gallon of milk a day. When I stopped gulping, I cut it in half. Cut my, and then cut out water completely. I used to drink, you know, maybe in the summertime, a half a cup a day, cup at the very most. You know, when I'm in Asia where it's very hot, here it's not. I never drink water here, except for maybe an ounce a week, two ounces a week. And that's that's it. true with that mineral water too, the gulping. Same the thing. Same with, with any fluid, any fluid at all. <coughs> you want to take it in slowly. Even whey? Even the whey, oh my gosh, yes, the whey is 98% water. Coconut juice? Pardon? Coconut juice? Coconut water, you mean? Yeah. Coconut water is just water. It's got a lot of minerals in it, it's got a tiny bit of sugar, it's got a tiny bit of protein, but it's basically water. It's like a whole coconut is too much for one person? In Asia, women do not drink coconut water because it causes them to bloat. It causes them to swell. Men will drink it there without <coughs> swelling, but women will swell. But the meat is a different story. Pardon? The meat is a different story. The meat of the coconut? Yeah. That's no problem. Yeah, I've heard some Well, it's cellulose. It's high in cellulose, so it's hard to digest the coconut for most people. A lot of cellulose. I'm going around the room for Q&A. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm you, yes. Um, I've been, like on the internet, there's people predicting like we're going to have, you know, huge food shortages. I just wonder if you got any tips, suggestions, or advice, like if we get us, you know, hit into a serious food shortage, how we still somehow, you know, stay on the diet? And still well, survive? it certainly won't be easy. I've got five gallons of honey put away. I've got uh, lots of butter, probably 30 pounds of butter, and I I keep them recycled in my refrigerator. Some of them are blue cheese, so I make my rope for dressing with the blue cheese, which is wonderful. Um, I also have meat that I've uh, uh, stuffed and cut up and stuffed in jars, some dehydrated. You know, uh, if I had to carry some that's dehydrated in oil, I did that in, uh, that's deer meat, most of that's deer meat. <coughs> Um, and I did that in the year 2000 for two y Y2K in case I never thought it was going to happen. But Why deer? Why deer? Uh, because a friend of mine shot it and I had to butcher it and I got a lot for butchering it. Okay. I got a third of the deer, so that's what I had you on the hand. Right. Um, I can do it with any meat. So what you do is you stuff it in a jar with like um, olive oil and it coats and surrounds it. And I've had uh, some beef jerky and oil for uh, ten, almost 10 years, well, 10 years, because I did it in 1999. And uh, I have one jar left, and I will open it in December again. I open one every December and we'll see how it holds up. Is and all that meat in the fridge, or do you keep it out? No, I get out. It's never out. refrigerated. No, oh. Never refrigerated. You know, once to the point when I put it in the jars with the olive oil, now, I tried coconut oil, but it doesn't quite last as long. Well, that's an odd amount. <laughs> you know what, Agnes? Uh-huh, okay. We were, we were out at the beach, and I just wanted to show him Lucky's place. And uh -huh. we happened to be a gathering. Uh -huh. I have no idea. I've okay. never been to one of your talks. Uh -huh. I know that you're generally, I know that you're generally <laughs> okay, here, sure. but I didn't even know that this was today, and we're both foodies. Pretty girl. But I just, I, I, I don't want to bounce in there, but I'm curious. Can I, can I ask a question before I leave? You already asked your question. Oh, yeah. No, she asked a question.
question of climate is subject to your talking about? I, I think that this is important. Okay. I, I've, I've been in the world for a while, uh -huh. been studying food for a while, and um, there's a really large gathering this weekend in Santa Barbara called the Raw Spirit Fest. Right. It's vegetarian. I had a booth there last year for a side business, but we were selling food. It was like, they got it right, a t-shirt, that's a, it's a company I'm involved in. And um, I've never, I've been to lots of festivals. I've never been um, at a festival where booth after booth after booth had so much information that I was interested in, and like, this is all about health. Or, now what's your um, question? <laughs> these raw vegans, like, they look so they and are sick. Right? <laughs> right. And we're supposed to like the, the amount of meat that you're suggesting, maybe a little too much for me, but I've done both. I've done yours for three years. That's how we, you know. And I never felt better. And the raw vegans are just, uh, where's the synergy? Where's the, like, at some point, we're all on the same path. We're not eating the McDonald's. We're not, you know, so where's the synergy? Like, how do we? Well, um, if you saw, if you read my, uh, I don't know if you subscribed to my <coughs> newsletter, I talked about the raw food event that we had in Hawaii in November. And the woman who uh, put together the spirit festivals. Happy Oikos. Yeah. Uh, real wired woman. Yeah, she and uh, she, she was. I mean, the guy who ran it was a young Italian boy who found raw foods and helped himself very well. He's my fiance. No, no, it's not him. He, he's straight yeah, up. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're he's, not him. No, he's, he's, he's Italian. Italian. No, no, he's Italian. Where are you from? Just the one you're in the house. Italian chef, my fiance. It's not him. Anyway, um, he put the thing together and he invited me and my group and people from Australia. So you saw all the group of my people who were there, who were good and muscular and all the skinny guys. And of course, whenever anybody on my diet in the competition, they won. Uh, right. So, you mean like this bowl? Yeah, the all the, you know, because it was supposed to be uh, the Raw Olympics. <laughs> oh, and that's what it was originally called. And I said, then you're talking about competition. So I got them to call it the Raw Games. It took me a two, couple of months to get them to change that over. But Happy and the other group were at, they were nuts with our raw meat table. I mean, they went crazy about it. Where was that? The crazy, Hawaii, they were crazy meaning they were upset? Oh, yeah. They were very oh, yeah. upset, very upset. Oh, yeah, I was in the corner, not because I wanted to um, hide my ceviche, but because I didn't want to get into a debate about why I was eating raw fish. There's an awful lot of judgment. Oh, oh my gosh. I've never it's been terrible. around. Yeah. And they started, really. they started the festivity was, we are here for peace and uh, peace, uh, peace uh, on uh, earth, and peace in the world. Uh, that's right. And then they go into all this judgmental bullshit. You know? so, and you know how many, I used to walk around with a camera called rawfoodmedia.com and everybody assumed I was a vegan. Meanwhile, I'm on the front of the plate and the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> And I went to New York and reviewed the raw food restaurants that are all vegan because there is no primal raw. And uh, not yet. It's not restaurant, not yet, right. Um, I have a class at, he's a chef. But so they all assumed, you know, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm vegan raw. Oh my gosh, it's, it's not even worth getting into a discussion. They didn't even let me on the main stage. They didn't let like you? To speak, they didn't let me on the main stage. The guy who's in charge let Happy be in charge, so she didn't let me up on the stage. Wow. After it was over and somebody brought that to his attention, I don't give a shit. I was happy <laughs> to, be to be able to see all of my people, wipe all those people out <laughs> in any competition. In fact, I said, you probably don't want to you know, involve yourself in too much of competition because you will steal it Why off. is it the raw goat milk, though? I've had a lot of them, the authors, that are uh -huh. vegan, 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 vegan. Well, yeah, raw goat milk's okay. Yeah. Well, you know, David Wolf, he's right. now drinking raw milk. Right. You know, and eating raw right. dairy. Right. Well, all of a sudden and I told him, I told him eight years ago, I said, David, you wait, you're going to hit that seven-year wall, and you won't be eating the diet you're eating. He says, oh, that's not true. When did you tell him? I told him that eight years ago. When I met him in San Diego when he first started going home on the diet. 
So what happened, seven years and three months, I get a call from some people who work for him in New York and said he's drinking the raw milk and eating the raw cheese now. He started on the raw cheese first. And he doesn't tell anybody. He didn't mention it at all at that festival in Hawaii. No, no, no they're, they're asking me on the side. I have the cameras, but when they're off camera, they're telling me on the side. It's okay, I do a little raw dairy. Yeah, I do a yeah. little raw dairy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's it's sad because there's a lot of people that need those particular vegetarians, raw food vegans, who are scatterbrained because they don't have enough protein. I mean, terribly scatterbrained. And they're not emotionally stable. I remember the when I talked to David that, that week, they came to my table. I was at a health, uh, Whole Foods, um, you know, whole, uh, a whole life convention in San Diego. And I was there as a raw fooder, raw primal eater with all of my meat and dairy. And this group of six vegetarians, David Wolf was one of them, he wasn't speaking because he was new to it. But the guy who was heading, I forgot his name, and he's going on to me and I'm talking calmly about the situation why when I did that it didn't work for me and I had to go to raw protein and lots of animal fats to be stable and to bring myself back because I kept getting skinnier and skinnier. I went down to 118 pounds without fasting. I was eating everything balanced according to the vegetarian raw food way and it just did not work. And they're arguing with me, arguing with me, and they all start foaming at the mouth a little bit. <laughs> when somebody gets angry, they get a little white bubble. Yeah, white bubble, yeah, right, right. Yeah, and, and even when I was a vegetarian, I did in a heated conversation, I would do that. You were a vegetarian? I was a vegetarian for six and a half years. So I hit the, the seven year mark uh, six months early. So the seven year, six year, seven year wall. So, um, here they were, and you know, they said, "Don't you know that that's create more violence and everything?" <laughs> I held a mirror up and I said, "You tell me who's violent and who's calm here." They <laughs> really looked at each other and they walked away. They never ever hassled me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, uh, I just came from the Raw Festival. I thought they looked great. Beautiful really? uh -huh. people. You were there? Yeah, I just came home this morning. Well, I just came back, and I, I don't see any. Well, you're talking about very young people on an early raw food diet. Happy yeah, anybody's great and vegetarian for six months, of course. Like, yeah. you get more greens than well, you've ever had. Well, they were doing beats on the silks down there that, you know, I don't see anybody able to climb those silks in this room. And there are vegans climbing that silk. Good point. But I'm telling you, we're point. talking so about people that who I haven't been on it very long. Yeah. Yeah. Like David Wolf, it took him seven years to hit that. The, the people who stay on a raw food, uh, Vegetarian diet have an attrition rate of 92%. That means 92% of the people who are on a veg raw vegetarian diet drop out because they can't sustain it. 8% can. 8% can. And those are the few people who can do that for a while. Look at David Wolf, the amount of energy he used to have. And then the more the less energy he got, the more he go to superfoods, <laughs> chocolate, <laughs> the overmind, caffeine, all these foods to charge him because he had no energy. So, and that's the way it is. If you had been to the Hawaii festival, almost everybody was long-term vegetarian, very weak. Yeah, you know, there's a picture. Of him. You sent me a picture. The picture is amazing because I thought Diogenes took this picture to make this guy look good and everybody else look skinny. But it was actually taken by the nose. paper. Yeah. yeah. Wait, 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 everybody else look skinny and him look healthy? No, it wasn't him, it was... Uh, you thought, you when I've been on my diet for three years... Right, you thought he had paid the photographer. Yeah, I thought he framed yeah. it to make it look <laughs> good. No, no. Yeah. No, it's that photographer who worked for Pahoa paper, uh, on one of the, um, a paper out of, uh, you know, the big island of Hawaii. and. She was standing on the side and the, watching the line of runners go, and my runner just happened to be right in the center. He's got all these muscles, he's running, everybody else is skinny, and he's taking off. You know, yeah, so, it's a great picture. Yeah, it's a great picture. <laughs> it's, in the, it's in my newsletter, one of the newsletters. Uh, 
and I think December is right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can I just ask one more thing on my question about the food shortage? Um, because I heard you have like a crossbow and stuff like that. A what? A crossbow. Yeah. Would it be realistic for city people like us to like, you know, like if all you can get is canned stuff? Could we, you know, like living off the land to some degree, like, or eating, like there's books on how to pick out edible plants and, and distinguishing from Yeah, but you're not gonna uh, do very well, I mean, well, you know, if you want a lot of energy, uh, that, but the people in Asia and, and third world countries who don't have meat, they, you know, in Africa, they're just killing everything, monkeys and eating everything. And it's like that in every country where you over hunted, and there's not much species left except for insects. So, I mean, in China and all of Asia, um, they raise insects, big cockroaches as big that they eat, scorpions, they eat everything of, a, you know, uh, of a nature that has animal tissue to it. Um, well, your women are used to eating cockroaches anyway, cockroach guts, that's what all um, uh, lipstick used to be made of up until 15 years ago. Because <laughs> yeah. it was, it was so a hundred degrees in a restaurant about it. Now there's three, four years in a restaurant about just all yeah. scorpions and insects. Yeah, right. So the raw, the fried. Because it's hard to get meat. Everything's getting lower and lower. The fish, you know, we don't have the, the animals we use, the creatures we used to have. So you have to go to whatever's available. So a lot of people are going to insects. But the cockroach has a white gut in it. It was the only thing that would adhere to skin. Mm -hmm. So if you saw the lipstick factories, they had miles of trays upon trays, one on top of the other, raging, raising roaches. Yeah. So they would kill somewhere around 60 million cro cockroaches a year for their fluid, and then they put dyes in it to make it color. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you were, that's what your that's what lipstick was made of. That was the so sixty percent of the ingredients. So that was sixty to seventy percent of the ingredients of lipstick. Now it's all chemical. We were better all off chemical. with the roaches. Was we were better off with the roaches. Absolutely, <laughs> rather than chemicals. Yeah, but I was just saying, you women, we've already had a head start on eating cockroaches. <laughs> you should be happy. Anyway, there's lots of things. I shoot my gophers and eat them. Really? Yeah, yeah. Really? Eat my plants. Would you eat a possum? Yeah, I eat a possum. I eat a it's raccoon. Possible. I'd read any animal. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem as long as the animal's healthy. I don't know if I but, you know. I've eaten, I, you know. I tried charcoal as another white animal, you know, for the snakes. Yeah. The crocodile stick, you know. Yeah. But really, really good. And the charcoal stock. Charcoal? Charcoal stock is yeah. really, really good. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, if you want to really have a lot of meat and you want to have a factory, raise crocodiles or alligators for meat. <laughs> I've got a, a friend in the Thailand who's got a crocodile farm, and she started off buying a 3,000 babies, and she built these rock, um, you know, about the size of this room here, and she puts a couple of hundred in each one, and then she has a chicken farm and she takes the chickens and feeds that to the alligators. I mean the crocodiles. So she gets to sell the skins for, you know, boots and belts and hats and stuff like that. And, and purses. Plus the meat she sells to the restaurant. Because they eat alligator and crocodile. Which answers to your sustainable Right. Now that is out of all of my search through Asia for the most Easy, easy, easiest farm farming to do are the crocodiles and chickens. Wow. Easiest to farm. And the white meat, and the crocodile white meat is really good. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is. is. Chicken, yeah. Big chicken and crocodile. Yes, you guys are really slowing down the pace of what's happening for everyone else. Yeah, we need a lot of get on to yourself. Yeah, yeah, I'm just waiting for their question. Well, okay. yeah. I know you got the yeah. So you heard enough. Yeah, good. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Roger, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, in, in the winter time, you you can't get the you know fresh air. We got to get, I mean, what? frozen, or you have to go with farm raised. Um, now the the frozen doesn't taste as good, but isn't it? As, as it's good? much better than the uh, the um, 
farm. farm, because the farm is mainly chemicals. With the farm, with, in the farms, what they do is they go to Purina, General Foods, and they buy their waste products that have all been chemically treated. Now we right now we have 60,000 chemicals in our food that are used to process food, and you know a lot of people say, oh well, it isn't in the food. We used it to process the food. <laughs> If you soak your, let's say, peaches or whatever you're eating in kerosene, kerosene is natural, and they call it natural, and you rinse it off after just soaking it for you know 20 to 30 minutes, do you think there's going to be any kerosene in that food? Absolutely. So on all this process, that's what they feed to these fish. Now, when the fish were first coming out of the farms, they were gray. Salmon was gray. It was so toxic. So the food industry paid the University of Washington and the state of Washington to make a, a, a food dye that they could feed to the fish. And they wanted it a food grade. It is a food grade, but it is not assimilable in the cells, but it colors the meat. So you're just getting food coloring and very, very anemic, sick fish. Anything that's far. <coughs> How about the frozen things? The frozen, like I've said in the workshops before, in my laboratory experiments with animals, if I fed them frozen meat, they all got skin disorders. If that's, and that's the only thing I fed them. The animals that ate the same meat unfrozen got no skin disorders and they were fine. So there is a breakdown with freezing. I found, however, though, that northern fish don't sustain that same kind of reaction that animals eat it, they don't sustain it. But let's say um, salmon caught from uh, a, a river in, uh, in Washington or Oregon or something like that, if you freeze it, there's a problem. A salmon caught in the rivers in Alaska can withstand and not have the same breakdown from the fro from freezing. So it gets specific and particular. This is why Eskimos can eat frozen fish every Yeah, time. but still they have a shorter lifespan than the animals, than the tribes that eat raw in a, a, a tropical warm environment. Because they're all eating this frozen food. I mean, when I was with them, they cut a hole that was a foot and a half thick into the the ice to fish, and by the time they got the fish out of the water to the mouths, it was already popsicle. Wow. And they had great teeth. Can you imagine being able to bite on a, a solid piece of ice like that? It's already a hard, and they, they, they could chew on bones. I've got a, a patient in Thailand who grew up uh, in the north of Thailand. She's about 52 now. She went on the diet about almost eight years ago, and she was in her late 40s at that time, looking, you know, Asians that eat a lot of grain, you know, shrivel up and shrink a lot because they don't have animal fats. And she was looking, you know, like maybe she was 60, even though she was in her late 40s. Now she looks like she's early 40s, late 30s, only on the diet for eight years but she eats everything raw, and her boyfriend is on the diet, and he's American. She does even better than he does. He still eats a little rice. She won't even touch cooked rice now. And she's more vital and vibrant than he is. She take, we went, uh, I was just there in, uh, in November before I went to Hawaii, and we went spear fishing and got a bunch of fish. I didn't get any. <laughs> it's not easy spear fishing. You know, you've got those, Waves and did you? Yeah, that was my first time spear fishing. And you've got to cock that bow, which is very difficult, in the water, up against your chest or your leg, and man, it was difficult. And then you've got to be able to catch that fish. You've got to wait and just wait for it to get in the right position. Then you have to know. And I never shot it underwater, so of course, the delayed timing of the shot, you know, was, the fish was already down by the time the arrow got past him. But anyway. Got some pretty big fish. He got some pretty big fish. He's a very good spear fisher now. He's been fishing for like spear fishing for like ten years. One fish had vertebrae this big, 
And I went back the next day to see them, and she's chewing on these vertebrae. I thought, oh, maybe they're kind of soft. So I asked for a piece, she gave me a piece. I worked an hour on it without even dissolving any of it. And she's just biting away like it's, you know, like it's some kind of a, you know, a soft candy. So after about an hour, I put a little bit of honey in my mouth. It dissolved in five minutes. No way. Yeah, it dissolved in five minutes. Yeah. I realized when I eat my bones, I'm going to have to add a bit of honey. <laughs> but can you imagine eating the bones and your teeth being that good and the Eskimos and teeth being that good that you can chew on bones? Shit, I've never been able to do that my whole life. Yeah, you know, even now, you know, even as healthy as I am. Of course, after the chemo, after the radiation therapy, all the bone around my teeth dissolved. So my teeth hung in my gums. So if I bit on my own teeth, I bled. I was getting a couple transfusions a week for that. And then when I started drinking the raw milk over the next year and a half, all the bone grew back mm -hmm. around my teeth. So I had most of my teeth. I've lost about five of my teeth. Um, uh, you know, the ones back here. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, uh, she has these great teeth where she can chew bones. That's spectacular, phenomenal. And all the tribes can do it, the Eskimos can do it. They love to have teeth like so uh, to answer your question, it has to be specific northern caught Alaska or Norwegian fish. Well, at, at the meat it. market, they tell you that, that, that they catch it on the boat and they freeze it right away and blah, blah, blah. Is, is that supposed to? But it doesn't taste as good. No, it never tastes as good. Frozen meat never tastes as good. In your book, it says frozen is the same as good. Yeah, well, not quite the same. Yeah, but it's it's but better it's than not it's better than not adding any meat at all. My deepest apologies, I'm so sorry if I interrupted. I've never been in the forum. <laughs> we'll come back without uh, without you know having to have a bit of a conversation. Yeah. Sorry. Take care. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I realize we interrupted. I'm sorry to be cutting. Okay. Next time we have plenty of food for everyone, we'll make up. No problem. Have a nice day. Sorry, my apologies. Okay, you. so. Um, now, there are some farms fish that are okay that are not really farmed in any other way other than they, uh, re they'll farm oyster, uh, oysters, clams, and scallops. Now, all they do is put a fence out in the ocean and call that their farm. They don't feed it anything differently than what's in the ocean. They just die when they try to do it any other way. But what they may do is they'll go over and rip up a, rip a little... Uh, oyster or clam or scallop a shell off of the mother or the parent and then plant it somewhere else because if they're left to be in their own soil in their own area attached to their own rocks they grow and develop larger so that's the only thing they do differently so uh, farmed scallops oysters and clams are okay unless they're from the Gulf of Mexico then you don't want to touch them very polluted there. If you're eating butter, good raw butter, unfrozen butter, it will help reverse the bad effects of frozen meats. So only with the animals that I thought that only the, the raw frozen meats had the skin disorder. And when I fed them raw butter, I took that group that had the skin disorder, split them in two, and fed them raw butter, frozen and non-frozen. The ones who had the raw butter, because I know that raw butter will reverse any kind of skin condition, skin condition over a period of time. So, um, and depending upon the quality of the butter, of course. So the animals that I fed the frozen butter took five times longer to heal their skin condition than the ones that ate the non-frozen butter. So you have to take a look at that. Sally Fallon and her stuff about freezing your meat gets rid of the parasites. <laughs> Show me a parasite in it in the first place. There are no parasites in it. Unless you sit them and let, sit and let them rot you know, for a while, of course <laughs> parasites are going to eat them. But the parasites are not toxic parasites. They eat the meat to digest it, to recycle the meat. Mm -hmm. And if it happens in us, great. They just make our job easier of digestion. 
Okay, do you have a question? Yes, Barbara. I do. Um, okay. My question is that we have various laws in effect that, um, like Codex Elementarius, yes, we have various laws coming into effect, such as Codex Elementarius, um, which to me is pretty scary because it removes the right that people have to use foods to uh, help themselves to heal, like cherries for gout or simple stuff like that. And yet it seems to be being foisted upon us through the back door. It has, the, the agriculture and the chemical industry has been pushing this for a long time. All of the morons, except for Ron Paul and Wexler and uh, Kucinich, there are only three out of uh, 537 congressmen that have any integrity at all. All the rest of them are just there doing their thing. When I was lobbying two years ago, in fact, two years ago this month, uh, in, uh, for raw milk, I even had the senator's aides asking me if I wanted a bill, I had to give them money. Everything is money. Everything is about <coughs> money. Ron Paul, I went in, they said, when do you need the bill written? Just like that. I said, well, we need to get enough supporters first. So let's get enough supporters first. And I got 78 supporters, and then when the bill was written, not one of them co-sponsored. And we called everyone and say, hey, you promised that if we got a, somebody to write the bill, you co-sponsor it and support it. Not one of them did. They're all just liars. They're, they're in the pockets of big money, period. That is their issue. And you have to understand, their lives are threatened. Their lives are threatened. They use the Kennedy as an example, Kennedy's as an example. Bush and his crew in the military, you know, and the big families murdered Kennedy, and they use that as a, a display. So of course these senators have no balls, you know, because they want, they don't want to be like the soldiers they sent off to war. They don't want to jeopardize their life for their values for any other value, so they're just hypocrites. I have no respect for any but those three. They're being pushed and there's no way you're not gonna get it. I saw dances that were going on that just made me angry. Dances? Did you see the shooter? Anybody see the shooter with Mark, War Mark Wahlberg? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the sinners, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. annihilating these tribes and everything in Africa to get oil pipes in, and at the end, you know, he, you know, they almost killed him, and they treated, killed him after he has, he has been part of that, um, that uh, troop or that organization who was mercenarily paid to go in and, and kill those people and then kill the people who did the killing so nobody knew anything to get rid of the evidence. So at the end, um, the, the senator, this guy, this guy, this retired Marine goes in and he's just gonna kill him all. He kills the, the general who's in charge and he kills the senator. He goes in and catches them in their hideaway home and they're bragging about how they're doing all this stuff and he just goes in and kills them. And he says, you can't do that to me. The senator's the last one to be shot. And he says, I'm a sitting senator. And he said, exactly, boom. Like that, yeah. you know, after being around in the Senate, that's just what I want to do. Because what they say is, they have a, an agreement. They all agree whether a bill is going to pass or not. So they get so many people saying, they will, you, you vote for it, but we'll always have enough not to let it pass. Or we have a bill that we want passed, and we'll have so many people go against it, but always enough for it to pass. It's a political thing. They play that game there, and I saw it. So how much voice we have, I say we have very little. What do we do to defend ourselves against that type of a thing? You have to take yourself out of the commercial realm. Government has jurisdiction only over commerce. So that's why I've set up all of those, uh, the right to choose healthy food with all the farmers. 
to the, the FDA has no jurisdiction over us taking anything over state lines. Because if you look at the law, they have jurisdiction over commerce. When we privately own the farms and the dairy and the herds and the flocks, that is our food. It's not for commerce. We can take it over the state lines if we want. So that's how we have to do it. You have to get as many farmers as you can uh, into it. Now, I've been trying to work with Sharon for three years on it. She still hasn't done it. Sharon? And the law just keeps going after her. Sharon who? Sharon, the woman who supplies our eggs and the whole chickens. Pardon? Healthy family farms. Yeah. Well, why is it, why is she stopping? She does not have a clear thinking about it. She's just in fear of the, of the law. But if we had public sponsored campaigns, don't you think that would help take some of this money out of the politics? Nope. No, it wouldn't, because these people are real greedy. So they would get the money and the... Absolutely, they're very greedy. They were trying to get money from me. Well, I, I know that. But, I mean, you know, Congress... It was Obama's. Money. It was Obama's, uh, you know, before he referenced two years ago. It was Obama's office where the guy was trying to get the money from me. The first one that tried to do that to me. Obama's office. That's the situation we're in. He's just a Yale, he's, I mean, a Harvard grad. He's one of the boys. He's doing nothing. He gives them money to the bankers, welfare for the bankers, like they need it. Do you have a question? Not for you. Okay, yes. do you have a question? Yes. Um, my dog, Mandy, the little blonde one, has been on a raw meat and raw vegetable diet for her whole life. She's got a raw vegetable? Soul. Yes, raw. Why would you give a dog vegetables? Well, it's mixed in with the organic raw meat. That Not a good idea. It's going to neutralize a lot of his acids. So he's going to digest maybe 65% of it instead of 100%. Well, okay. Um, she has not been feeling well, so I took her in, and they said her blood sugar was so low that it's it, as if she has a, a glucose-secreting tumor in her pancreas. Right. And then I went in for an ultrasound, and there was nothing in her pancreas, and but they did see that her uh, liver was inflamed as, as if it had hep she had hepatitis. So she, mm -hmm. now I've taken her off the raw food diet, and she's... I'm cooking it now, because that's what they suggested that I do. And she's also on uh, immune uh, supporting herbs and carnivore and manuka honey. So sad for her. So uh, <laughs> I just take the vegetable out of it. And she's not digesting, she's not making her peruvate properly with the vegetation in there. So if she just goes on a straight raw meat. Raw meat, with, uh, butter, a little honey. How do, you, how do you feel about manuka honey? Does it make any difference? It's, I've never found a manuka honey that's truly raw. Would avocado work if you don't have butter? You mean for the dog? Yeah. It's okay. It's not an animal product. It's like the, and dogs and cats need almost pure animal product. Dogs are scavengers. They will eat all kinds of fruit. They won't eat vegetation out in the wild, but they would, except for chewing on some grass and then spit out the pulp, and that's very, very little. But they will eat dates, they'll eat avocados, if they drop it down, many. Um, I've seen the wolves and the coyotes, they'll eat dates all day long, you know, but, uh, and then when they get too sugared out, you know, then they'll go for the moles and everything else. <clears throat> but they're, they're mainly meat eaters, animal product eaters. Give them dairy and their meats. <clears throat> you put vegetation in there, and they're not going to digest the proteins to make the peruvate. Peruvate's the protein sugar. Yeah, they said that she wasn't getting any nutrients from her food, and it was just going right through her. It wasn't going through her, it was not digesting thoroughly. And that's why you put veget. I tell everybody else, don't eat vegetation with your meals, your raw meals. If you're having a cooked meal, fine, have a raw vegetable salad with it, it'll help. But if you're having a raw meat meal, you do not want vegetation with it.
So you yeah. should eat your salad as in one sitting, or not eat salads at all? Not eat salads at all, I have vegetable juice. When you're going to have a salad, then you have it the last meal of the day. I have a similar question uh, to that, which is meat mixed with cheese in any form, or bone marrow mixed with like raw cottage That's cheese. That's all meat. Uh, That's all compatible. So bone marrow you can mix with raw cottage cheese? Yeah, absolutely. Those are animal. I mean, unless you're Jewish. Well, I'm Jewish yeah. also, but that doesn't uh -huh. matter. But <laughs> So you, I could, in other words, I, I've been making this raw custard with the bone marrow and raw cottage cheese and great, it's fine. Honey and lemon and onion. Honey and, and lemon. A, a little bit of honey, tiny bit of honey. I mean, a little and bit fresh, of lemon. Little fresh, little fresh lemon, no good. How much? About a tablespoon. And what how else? much cottage cheese? About well, I have two pounds of bone marrow, plus about a cup of cottage cheese. Okay, that's all right. It tastes it's great. It tastes well, like good. It tastes it's wonderful. only a tablespoon of lemon juice. That's okay. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. The lemon juice. Yeah. I prefer if you're going to use a digestive aid, use pineapple rather than lemon. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. It's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. it contains a bromelain. You know, the lemon juice is a fermenter. It helps increase fermentation bacteria. That'll help break down the cottage cheese, but in the the bone marrow, you don't necessarily want it involved in the bone marrow. Mm. So I would mix the, you know, the, the lemon juice with the ch cottage cheese and then put the bone marrow in. Mm. That's the way I would do it. You don't put the right, lemon so in. just substitute a little yeah. pineapple for the lemon. Or you just eat a piece of pineapple, mm -hmm. you know, after you finish the meal or in, in the middle of the meal. Right. That'll increase that. Mm -hmm. Honey's good, it helps increase as long as you don't have too much. Well, even yeah, at the meat meal, pineapple. you would eat a little pineapple? Yeah. Pineapple better than papaya? Yes. Oh. It's almost impossible to get non-irradiated papayas these days. Oh, even with the government, uh, these people who are, and I'm Jeez, telling you, these people are working against oh, wow. us being healthy. The papaya, let me tell you what papaya does. My mother got um, cancer about seven years ago of the breast. She called me and she said, I'm going to have a lumpectomy and I'm going to have pinpoint radiation. I said, Mom, <laughs> why are you going to have a lumpectomy? Do you have all your, the lymph glands that they're going to remove, are they as hard as rock? No, but that's where it can metastasize. I said, Mom, you're a nurse. The lymph glands clean the body. Right. Of course you're going to have cancer cells in any lymph gland. You have them removed, and where's the cancer going? Where say cancer cells going to go if you don't have lymph glands? It's going to go into the mammary gland, absolutely without question. Plus, you're going to have pinpoint radiation. What's behind your, what's behind your breast? The lungs. Oh, pinpoint, very accurate. Won't harm my lungs at all. I said, get a guarantee and get it in writing. She was on oxygen for five years. That's how pinpoint they are. Medical profession is so full of bullshit, it just makes me angry. Okay, so my mother, after that, at the end of that five years later, when she was starting to get off the oxygen, she got a new hearing aid implant. It's implanted under the skull in the brain. They gave her tons of antibiotics, so she stopped digesting. I got a call when I'm in Asia. I'm on my way back, just happened to be that day leaving and returning home. Uh, they said my mom's going to die, you know, uh, any day and to come. And I said, well, it's going to take me about, you know, 32 hours to get there because I'm all the way to Bangkok to get there. So I was in Singapore. So I had to fly all of those, you know, 30 some hours to get back to Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. So got back there and she's a skinny rail. She just stopped eating because of all the antibiotics. They didn't take her on. They kept her on the antibiotics. Six months on these antibiotics, of course, she's not digesting. So I made a custard. I gave her a half a cup of custard. She ate four meals that day. The next day, ate the half a cup of custard, ate four meals that day. And we're not talking raw foods, except for that custard. The next day, she wouldn't touch it. I put a lot of butter in. She was nauseous from the butter, obviously her liver had been damaged from all the antibiotics. So I just gave her a half a cup of papaya. 
Every day that I gave her, she ate four meals a day. I said to my father, now I say I have to go now, and you can see if she's eating, and you've got to give her this papaya every day. So I leave and my father gives me a call five days later. She's not eating anymore. I said, are you feeding the papaya? No. Hello? <laughs> papaya helps digestion so well mm -hmm. that they're irradiating all sources of it because they don't want you healthy. Uh, so including the ones that bind to James, it's no good to bind to James. Let me tell you, I found some of them were actually irradiated. You and you can them? tell they irradiated because they shrivel up on one part where they're exposed to the radiation. So as they sit, if the thing shrivels up evenly all over, it wasn't subjected to radioactive material. But when it, and I let mine, if I have one, I let it go till it starts shriveling. If it shrivels in one spot, I don't eat that. Papaya. But I have to let it go to shrivel point to do this. You have to understand they're out to kill us. They want to make us sick. They believe in overpopulation. If you read uh, Article 2, I mean, the Report 200 of, uh, of uh, the Henry Kissinger Report on overpopulation and all the ways to get rid of overpopulation, and they want to get rid of 4.5 billion people, they do it through injection, medical injections, and, and poisoning the food source. Those are the plans in that document. And the NSA adopted them in the 1960s. So they've been behind that plan ever since. The, NSA the only know. way we can protect ourselves is get farmers growing food specifically for us. And then to make sure they're out of the government pit. Can't get Sharon out of it. It's very little paperwork. It's a, two simple contracts. Easy as that. Why can't she do it? It's no time. She's got Sally Fallon's attorneys telling her one thing and me telling her another. And Sally Fallon's lost a lot of battles. I have not lost one yeah. in court. Because they have no jurisdiction. But you have to understand, so attorneys make a pledge and vow to the court. They don't make it to the Constitution. So your attorneys will never work if a judge debars them. That's the end of it. What is it that Sharon's not doing? She's not entering a contract. She wants to sell at farmers markets and do all that to the general public. And if she does that, she has to make everybody she sells to a member of the club if she wants to be out of the commercial end of it. And she cannot sell anybody that is not a member of the club. So she wants it both ways, so she can't have it. But she goes she has 15 markets. Pardon? She's selling in 15 markets. That's not enough to, with this new acquisition of property, there's no way she can sustain that property. She's going to go bankrupt. Well, I hope not. She's going to go bankrupt if she's relying upon those 15 markets for her income. There's no way she can make that kind of money. So the debt is too outrageous. And I warned everybody. I warned everybody who got involved in it. Don't do it. Not set up. She's not set up for it. She doesn't know what she's doing. So what is James going to do if he goes bankrupt? Who knows what James will do? <laughs> James is off on his trip to None of them know what to do. I'm successful and yet these people are. It's like your own family, how your own family doesn't listen to you? My own family doesn't listen to me. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I, for about four months ago, I started out in a little right quadrant pain, sort of in the cecum area. Uh -huh. uh, it was a little swollen. Cecum's way down here. Yeah, it was like, so that, it's actually right in here. So That's appendix. Is. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, swollen. Uh, waves of pain coming across the stomach, and then afterwards, every 15 to 30 minutes, I would urinate dark orange. Mm -hmm. um, I've been fairly, you know, um, no, no, no fast food, none of that. I've been done for years, and I grew up on that. But uh, I was, I was eating only fresh fish and vegetables, lots of green juice, and I basically, um, I 
started eating pork, natural pork, and whole foods. And I just had this kind of this intuition that maybe it was uric acid, something like that being processed down here, and my body was getting it out. So my family wanted me to go to the emergency room and a doctor, the whole thing, no way, right? So I went through nine days going on the internet this is before I came across you, and uh, went on to doctor, uh, this guy who's a natural hygienist here, he just says to just lay down and fast. Dr. Sleep. Bass? No, Bass is where I found your article. Okay. But first was uh, Dr. Bernard, and he just said drink, drink water, and just rest and mm -hmm. close your eyes, put your hand on that area. So I did that, but it was the pain wasn't going away, but I'd, I'd feel not horrible if I did that and slept. Anyway, uh, and just drank water for about eight or nine days, a little bit of citrus here and there. Um, and then it started to break around the ninth day. Um, then I got onto Dr. Bass's website, I read your article, went on to, you know, and so I started going and getting fish, cheeses, different things. About a month ago, it came back, but not with chills and sweats and where I'm hurting, more like pain there. Mm -hmm. Like my body's okay. continuing Sounds to- Sounds like your appendix. Okay. okay. Okay, so the appendix is the library of all foreign matter that's ever entered the body and what to do about it chemically. Okay. So that appendix is a very important little organ. Sometimes, people will store a lot more toxins in that appendix than they should, and it will burst. Mm -hmm. But it is a very important organ to have. Yours is probably trying to detox. Right. It had too much stored in it. And still, I was afraid they'd cut it out. I'd want to cut it out if I yeah. wanted to get to the doctor. But what you do is, when you have a situation like that, you eat a tremendous amount of cheese and clay. Clay. Now, if you want to make sure that if there are heavy metals involved to neutralize right. some of those heavy metals, you have a mixture of, like, I'll make a mixture of like a half a cup of whey mm -hmm. with about an uh, uh, ounce to two ounces of liquid moist clay that's the same thickness of, as freshly made plaster of Paris. Okay. And then I will add one to two tablespoons of vinegar to that, okay. a couple of tablespoons of honey, maybe just one, but most often one and a half to two okay. uh, tablespoons of honey. And then coconut cream, like three tablespoons of coconut cream mm -hmm. and two tablespoons of dairy cream. Okay. Blend that together and then I suck sip that okay. for you know, maybe the whole day or if I've got uh, uh, heavy pain, like for this. Mm -hmm. I couldn't mm -hmm. wait till I got home to start eating the clay. Mm -hmm. And this, all of this subsided very rapidly because my, I had enough clay and nutrients to get in there okay. and help chelate with that so not all of it had to rupture my skin. Okay. So it cut the the breaking of the skin down, okay. you know, because I started breaking all over. Right. And when I started eating the, the that mixture, right. only two broke out after that, one here, right. and um, well, that was it. Just one after I started eating that mixture, only one broke here. What, what kind of clay? Yeah. Uh, Terramin clay. Terramin. T e r r a m i n. You can go to terramin.com. Yeah. Okay. Not terraminclay.com. Terramin.com. Okay. Um, and I, I read in your book the tomatoes uh, with honey and then the lime juice that helped. That helped. But uh, but I, I'm seeing. I was drawn to coconut cream automatically. Yeah and just lots of fat uh, that I would get down here, down the street, from Austin. But the, uh, the uh, vinegar, the raw and pasteurized apple cider vinegar has the same amino acids that they use in chelation therapy. Mm -hmm. Why don't they use vinegar for chelation therapy? Because there's no money in it. Yeah. Right, right, right. You can do it on your own. created my own because okay. I didn't like what, what you were doing. Yeah. Okay. Because what I saw in people wasn't what I was told. Okay. So I developed my own. So So if we do a consultation we could talk more about that maybe if you could just give me a couple pointers or something. Yeah. I mean that's a whole study in itself. So should I just start looking on my own? What you could, yeah, yeah, just start okay. finding people that have conditions and see what shows up in the eye with people with similar right. similar conditions. Right, okay. Got it. 
my buddy? No. <laughs> okay, do you have a question? Yes. Um, it's an environmental question, or it's two of them, actually. I'm having uh, insulation done in my house, and I want to know... Insulation? If, you know, to, to uh, yeah, the insulation... In the walls, or where? Yeah, well, that's, what I'm, that's part of my question, is uh, how should I do that? Because right now, I'm leaking, leaking air conditioning, and I want to have insulation, and I know they have different materials, and they have different stuff, and I just wanted to know if you have any recommendations... Of Old, torn-up jeans. <laughs> Literally. Uh, uh, the uh, a lot of <laughs> a lot of gr green communities are taking jeans that can be resold, and mm -hmm. they're so to the point of wearing out. And uh, you know these secondhand stores don't sell them; they're throwing a massive amount of them away. And these uh, green community, like in uh, Earth Haven in North Carolina are insulating with jeans, and it works in wonderfully. Also, you could take straw and put that in there, but it could be a fire hazard. Yeah, I was thinking that. But, um, <laughs> Denim doesn't have the same fire burning ability as straw does, but straw will, you know, So obviously, nobody here has any recommendations as to who I can go to for that. But a lot of that sustainable building stuff is really toxic stuff. No, no, they're no, just I'm recycling. No, I agree, but the the there's, there's some that you can find. If you go to Cal Poly San Francisco's website, you'll see that professors have done their own that are outside of the profession because the industry doesn't allow it. But there's articles, tons of articles, you'll find them in Google. And there's real good ones. Bean is a good one. Um, there's a couple more out there. Okay, so just don't feed that other stuff. Like I say, denim is the best. You can find no, other natural the straws that you can mix with clay and put it in there. And that would keep I just it need someone to do it. Pardon? I need someone who's going to do it, too. There's I, a lot of sustainable people in this town which will come and do it to get the experience. There's a fellow named Larry Santori. Santoro, Santori. Um, he, I took his class on sustainable living and oh, permaculture, yeah. and uh, he puts groups together who like to do things naturally. And they'll do it on a weekend or a week, and he gets volunteers to get involved in it so they have their first-hand use. And he'll come in and he'll explain how it's done. He only charges a thousand dollars one day to tell you what to do. That's it. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and then the, in the same vein, I need to get a new mattress, and I wanted to know, because um, I know mine has all kinds of features on it, so I want to know where to get a mattress, or what to do. I had mine made. I went to his futon place, um, and they manufactured them in San Francisco, just a futon place in La Brea, and I you know, said, I want you to get...